Hi, I'm Sophie Todd and I'm the series producer of Our Great National Parks. And I'm James Honeybourne and I'm the executive producer of Our Great National Parks. A fish that can walk. Surfing hippos want to catch the waves. Species found nowhere else on Earth. Join me in this celebration of our planet's greatest national parks and wilderness. Around the world, the more isolated the national park, the more unusual its creatures, yeah, yeah. and the more extraordinary their behaviors. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When humanity started to protect these wild places, we did not realize how important they would become. They're a haven for endangered species and a hotbed for scientific research. This sloth has an entire micro kingdom living in his fur. Researching him will help fight cancer, malaria, and antibiotic resistant superbugs. This sleepy sloth might just save us all. But we got that, we got that thing. Yeah. We got that, we got that star gazing in our eyes. What we got? This is a journey through the natural wonders of our shared birthright. This is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin and London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week, I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week, it is my pleasure to welcome acclaimed filmmakers James Honeybourne and Sophie Todd, the exec producer and series producer behind the original Netflix docuseries, Our Great National Parks. This breathtaking five-part series is executive produced and narrated by Pre President Barack Obama, who protected more public lands and waters than any other U.S. president in history. President Obama takes us on a journey to experience nature in the world's most iconic national parks. Spanning five continents, the series brims with wonder, humor, and optimism, as each episode tells the story of a national park through the lives of its wildest residents, both big and exceptionally small. The series explores our changing relationship with wilderness, traveling from the waters of Monterey Bay, California, to the bright red soil of Kenya's Savo National Park, the lush rainforest of Indonesia's Gunung Leser National Park, the majestic terrain of Chilean Patagonia, and more. Our great national parks beckons us to get out and explore, create new ways for these wild places to thrive, and vigorously preserve them for future generations to come. Stay tuned as we learn about James and Sophie's experiences making this series and what it was like working with President Barack Obama. James and Sophie, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you, Sophie? Really cool, really good, thanks. We're, we're well. Yeah, and James? Yeah, all good. Thank you. We're uh, based in Bristol in the west of England at the edge of the Celtic Sea. And um, excited uh, that the uh, series will be premiering very soon. Well, yes, that series is, as you've already alluded to, and we've heard uh, coming into this in the intro, is Our, our Great National Parks. It uh, released on April 13th on Netflix. And um, basically a, a very a vi a visually stunning series, if I, if I may add. Um, uh, Sophie, maybe you can get us started uh, for our listeners who uh, maybe haven't had a chance to, to watch this on Netflix. Uh, what is our great national parks all about? Maybe you can give us a synopsis. Um, well, it's the global celebration of a modern, well, not that modern, a conservation success story, I should say. Um, it's about 100, it's 150 years since Yellowstone uh, opened its gates mm -hmm. and um, 
Now we have over 4,000 national parks around the world. It's a truly global phenomenon, and it's something that we can champion and be really proud of. Would you say, James? I would. You know, there's there's a lot of things in conservation and environmental issues going on at the moment, obviously. Mm. Uh, but within that, to have a, a real success story, which is the, the growth of these parks, and actually 50% of all national parks in the world have been founded in just the last 50 years. So it really is a current mm. movement. And um, we, we hope that uh, people will see the value of these bases and, and remind themselves of the value of these bases mm. um, because they're some of the most uh, extraordinary, stunning, breathtaking locations uh, and some of the last great wilderness areas left on the planet. Yeah. Well, and as, as you were saying, James, I mean, it's the 150th anniversary of uh, Yellowstone, the first national park being found. I mean, what was... How was this project conceived? I mean, what was the uh, what was the reasoning behind it? Because as, as you both are well aware, and certainly you, James, uh, there's loads of nature docs that are coming out all the time. Uh, what's uh, I mean, further on to what you were already saying, what is different about this one? Maybe what what have we not seen well, before? I guess um, we were looking at. I was looking at uh, what I've done in my career and the impact that some of the series have made and thinking, what should we be really talking about? What conversation can we generate at the moment that maybe is a little bit um, under the radar? Uh, and given the state of the planet and what's happening, what should we be really turning a spotlight onto? And it struck me that really the importance of wilderness on earth today is so important because nature only exists where we let it and um and and wilderness needs people you, we, you know it, nothing really exists in isolation anymore so we need to uh, look at our relationship with wild places wild spaces everywhere uh, and that was the sort of premise which got us thinking about how um, how we might tackle the subject. Now, at the same time, um, we were introduced by Netflix to Higher Ground, yes. um, the Obama's production company, and and it was wonderful to meet um, to meet them early on and to develop an idea. Uh, and it felt that actually national parks are um, uh, the pinnacle of conservation that any country can give a wilderness area. Uh, and that that would offer a good organizing principle for for, for the series. Um, and then it was really a case of, well, which park do we choose? And as, as Sophie knows too well, when you've got 4,000 parks to choose from, um, that's not so easy, is it? <laughs> no, it's not an easy task at all. Well, I was going to ask you about, uh, you know, President Obama and, uh, and higher, higher Ground's involvement in this. And uh, I mean, did they, did he help, sh did they help shape the storytelling? uh of of this and um i think certainly that they've been involved from the beginning uh from yeah. the development all the way through when we started to go out filming and we were sharing some of the uh footage that we were getting and talking about the parks that uh we were considering featuring i mean from our perspective we wanted to have a, a range of habitats that would reflect the globe, because um, national parks can be in any type of habitat. Mm -hmm. I mean, we feature leopard seals on fjords in Patagonia mm -hmm. as much as bison in Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to reflect that, that it's a global thing, phenomena, but also that the president has a really personal connection to these places. He protected more natural national um, space, natural space than any president in US history. So he, he has a connection on one home side in terms of his legacy, but also he talks a lot in uh, his autobiography and things he's uh, spoken about, his connection to national parks in the past. So we looked at those as well to see where there were connections. And plus, for example, his father was born in Kenya. So we look at a park in Kenya, as he says, the land of my father. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, all of those things came together and he was very much a part of the decision making process yeah mm. but was he always on tap to be the narrator was that uh, or did that come later well that, 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 i think that really sort of developed you mm. know that that so i high ground um a very open and keen to let the artist's vision lead the production so mm. but but we were in conversation all the way through and i think there came a point where um you know it was clear that 
Um, we were getting some really great behavioral sequences. Uh, the series was really, um, you know, starting to come together very nicely. And it was something that I think it was just a very natural fit um, to, sli to slip into that um, um, sort of closer relationship with the president becoming a narrator. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and and obviously the point is to talk about these these national parks. But uh, if I if I may, do you, with working with uh, someone like President uh, Barack Obama, I mean, do you rewrite his script? Did he rewrite his scripts? Do you coach him on narration? I mean, how does that, well, <laughs> how does yeah, that work? Yeah. Uh, I did direct him on the ground when we were filming, um, yeah. and we directed him in the common record. But to be honest, he needed very little um, direction and. I mean, he's done more filming than, than uh, probably than either of us edited together. In, in, so he's very comfortable with the camera and it's something he's incredibly passionate about in places that he really cared about. So it was, mm -hmm. he was very um, relaxed and intuitive. Uh, there were a few changes to um, things he made in the, in the final com record. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'd, we'd written something about um, anisia fruit being the same size as an American football. And he started right. laughing and said to him, it's just a football. <laughs> like to us, it's just, when we think of a football, we think of a soccer ball. So it was, it was a little bit of yeah. that. Um, but yeah, it was great, wasn't it? Yeah. No, it was a lot of fun um, in the commentary records. And yes, I mean, he, the, the president certainly brought his own voice to it. And, mm -hmm. you know, even on the day, we'd, we'd tweak the old lion yeah. if, if, if it sounded, you know, he had a better way of saying it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it was a, it was a collaborative effort, really. Yeah, and and uh, yes, and I had that same conversation with one of my children about the Anisia fruit and the American football and football discussion. So, uh, uh, but you've worked with uh, you know, I uh, know James, you have certainly uh, worked with legendary uh, Sir David Attenborough. I mean, what was it like working? It, is it how does it compare? I mean, I, I guess they they they're coming at this at different from different directions and. Uh, I guess uh, partly what I'm getting at is, does uh, President Obama cons thinking he's got a career in, uh, in in leading nature docs? Oh, well, um, you'd really have to ask the president that. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, th th they're both great men and great orators, and they both have great authenticity in the stories they tell. Um, so, you know, so David has... Uh, an unparalleled track record, hasn't he? In, yeah, in extolling yeah. the wonders of, of the nat natural world, and, and isn't that wonderful? Um, the framing on this series is different. It's more about yeah. our relationship with wilderness, and I think to have a, a world leader and um, uh, and uh, a perspective that comes more from from the human side of that, because parks need people. Um, I, I, you know, it's a, it's a different thing, and the president is is just the right person for the job. We feel so. Um, no, it's great to have, great to have the president on this, and it feels like it's a very forward facing series. It's mm. a series that we make very much with the next generation in mind, and it's really about our relationship with parks today and tomorrow. Okay. Well, I uh, almost feel like we should leave it with that. That's a great uh, great way of uh, putting it. But speaking of this future generation, so this is uh, certainly a film I was able to watch with my children. And um, it was interesting. It, it, it struck me that, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, there's definitely, how best to put it, there's a there's maybe a more positive approach to this film than you maybe will, we will have seen in some recent uh, uh, very good nature docs that have come out in the last few years i mean is that uh, was that a conscious decision and approach is that a, f a fair way of putting it we we weren't going to shy away from the issues but yeah. equally um we wanted to be optimistic about some of the solutions that are being employed because there are incredible solutions to the yeah. big uh, challenges that conservation are facing at the moment a lot of which happen in national parks um don't you think yeah and i think if we if we want to inspire people to do more, you have to offer them hope and solutions. And uh, national parks are doing some incredibly mm. uh, incredible things around the world. And each of the parks we feature uh, tell us something more about the role that parks play. But some particular parks we feature, like Rwanda, um, like Patagonia, mm. they, they give us visions for the future of parks and where we could go if we decide to. And I think it's key that we do. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that's fair enough. I mean, it was interesting because my young, my younger ones were very much, uh, 
look, it's not a comparing, I'm not trying to compare or uh, it's, it's unfair comparisons, actually. It's just a different approach, as you say. Um, but they responded quite well. They really, I was, it was interesting to watch how they, they viewed this. They liked the, um, they liked that solutions-based approach. Let's put it that way. That's, that's wonderful. I, you know, yeah. it's, it's important that, that we give people hope. And, and so it is purposefully hopeful. I think that's the, that's the tone that we try to strike. Whilst, whilst not sugarcoating the problem, you know, we're very clear about those. Mm. Um, but, but it's about our relationship and relationships can be improved. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and if we do it wisely, then the, the, you know, nature and humanity can coexist. And by the way, actually, we need that to happen because if you want to have a healthy planet and if you want to be healthy yourself, you need fully functioning wilderness doing yeah. all the jobs that it does. Mm. And we've got a campaign as well to go with the series as well for people that are inspired to enable them to do more. And that's wildforall.org. That's right. Um, okay. So after, once the series goes out, we hope that momentum will carry the ideas in the series forward and enable more people to connect. Yeah, it's there to sort of activate inspired audiences to learn more about nature protection and how to get involved. Well, that's great. I mean, I was going to ask you, and we'll obviously put some links in the show notes so people can can link to that and and uh, and read some more on them on this themselves. I mean, your view would then be, I mean, it's a broad subject. We could spend many hours discussing this, but. Uh, your view is to be relatively positive and, and there is still a chance. I mean, we definitely had the, you know, the last week we've had the UN uh, IPCC come out saying it's the ability to limit warming to uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius is going to be very extremely difficult to say the least. But uh, I guess uh, your view, well, I guess maybe the way to put it is what, I mean, you've alluded, there's a campaign coming out, but maybe while we're, we've got you here, you can kind of, Give us some ideas on what we as individuals can do to to help. Well, I think whatever the headlines are, however bad it is, we have to try. The stakes are too high for us just to say, oh, well, we're doomed. Let's give up. We have to stand up. And the series offers some ways forward on on a park level. Um, And as as, uh, James was saying, the world for all Give us a sort of personal level, um, in terms of individual actions. Well, that's that, that's on the website as well. They're pretty much right? all on the website. Uh, yeah. Please yeah. encourage uh, listeners of this to to go to that. Um, you know, change comes from two areas. It comes at a government level, and it comes at the level of individual mm-hmm. action. And um, change happens more quickly when. It happens at both ends of that spectrum, I think. Right. And, and that was certainly the experience we had. I've had previously when I made Blue Planet 2 and the mm-hmm. so-called Blue Planet effect that happened afterwards. Um, and, and the series is there to, to, to uh, entertain audiences globally around the, you know, the wonders of wilderness. And the and what it does for us, and uh, I think the take home from the series for me is is really about hopefully valuing our relationship with wilderness and wild spaces, and realizing that that uh, we all have a role to play in that, and that it's important to us all. Um, and then we can hope that governance, i.e., um, world leaders, United Nations. Um, by the way, how people vote, therefore, does matter. Um, you know, these things all, all tie up the other end as well. So it's, 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 for, for me, the most important thing is that we get a conversation going. Because if we overlook uh, these, these wild places, if we think they're just empty and not doing vital functions for us, if, if, we, um, if we undervalue them, then we're missing a big trick here. So, so it's the joy of, our, of the job, really, is hopefully creating... Uh, a series which can entertain and inform um, and help um, introduce people to the ideas of the of the values of wild spaces everywhere. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. Okay, I think that brings us to uh, an early break for our listeners. So um, we'll be right back with uh, James Honeyborn and Sophie Todd, the exec producer and. Pro- series producer of Our Great National Parks, globally released on April 13th on Netflix. If you enjoy Factual America, check out the Movie Maker podcast. That's all one word, Movie Maker. 
where our friends at MovieMaker.com interview everyone from filmmakers just breaking in to A-listers like David Fincher and Edgar Wright about their movie-making secrets and behind-the-scenes tricks of the trade. They go deep and let the guests speak uninterrupted to get you the most film insight. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with acclaimed filmmakers James Honeyborn and Sophie Todd. The Netflix docuseries Our Great National Parks, globally released on April 13th on Netflix. We were talking about uh, sort of, uh, and very eloquently, you were saying what you want the legacy, basically, of this film to be and how we value our, um, um, our, our national parks. I mean, if I may, I'm going to um, in- ask you a question from one of our listeners, watchers, uh, who also happens to be my nine-year-old son. Uh, but uh, <laughs> who, uh, let's see, how can, how can sloths cure cancer? <laughs> wow, that's, that's a very good question. Um, and it's one that we, we look at in episode one. Um, it, it's a discovery that was made that the sloths have um, an algae that grows on their fur when they're wet effectively and it it has medicinal properties that have been shown could be effective in cures for cancer could help when antibiotics stop working for us Um, so there's multiple uses and it's the sort of discovery that can only be made if we keep the habitats to keep the sloths in the first place lose the sloths we never find out these multiple options that there are throughout the world that could offer us answers for questions we don't even know that we're going to need. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. It, the- it. It's all about sloth fur and, yeah, the, the, the sort of microcosm that exists within it. Um, and, and once you start looking more closely at nature, you discover these things everywhere. And, and that's the thing about rainforests. There's still so much we don't know. So the sloth's really an example of just one creature in one rainforest. Yeah. But the truth could be said for all the millions of creatures in all the world's rainforests, a load of which we don't even we haven't even mm. discovered or named yet. And, and in fact, that's so common still that when we were filming in Indonesia in right. Bonomosa National Park, yeah. we discovered and filmed a species that has yet to be identified, has no, no, you know, scientific name, uh, and that was the uh, the hammerhead worm. Exactly, which is a great creature. Um, it's only about as big as your fingernail. Uh, it doesn't have any eyes. Um, it has a mouth in the middle of its body, um, and it's a slug and snail killer. Yeah. Um, but it's a it's a gruesome little beast that made a great seen and and is a new species to science apparently well, well and and it was a big hit in my family i can tell you that but uh, <laughs> i uh, um i mean how do you is this how you know when filming nature docs is this how it works you, you've because obviously you have you've you've been filming you've had many uh nature docs previously but is that is is there always this process of discovery as you are filming that you are i mean you probably didn't plan on finding the hammerhead worm but uh Things like well, this. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we we had hoped to find a hammerhead when we didn't realize it would be a new species at the time. Yeah. But uh, um, by spending weeks and weeks in yeah. the wild yeah. um, and looking very closely at the wildlife, you do see things that haven't been yeah. seen before. And and it's not the only example I'm at. Well, in, in Savo, for example, mm. we've got mongooses cracking open giant African land snails by throwing them between their legs, a bit like an American football. Uh, and um, and they uh, th- that behavior had never been recorded in Savo before with that species of mongoose. So that was that was new as well. We f- filmed a iguana in uh, Singi Dem Banaraha National Park, didn't we? That hadn't, iguana, yeah. had only recently been um, identified. identified through DNA studies as a new species. So um, I, I think it's by virtue of just looking, or, or the, you, sh- you should tell the story of the super wieners. Well, the, the oh, super yeah. Wieners. I mean, there's, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's lots of these things where, um, we discover things because we're there, but also because we're working with the scientists. Right. A lot of people have contributed to the series and they've t- told us about their research. And um, with the super wieners, their scientists had told us that they occasionally 
occasionally see a, ma- a young, usually male pup, but um, I'm not casting aspersions there, uh, who decides that when he's left, when his mother goes out to see that he's still hungry and will try and go in for another round of feeding. And what he does is he sort of, by stealth, sneaks in between a mother feeding another pup and bumps that pup over out of the way so it gets a second round of feeding, turning into these monstrous little seals. Mm. Um, and so scientists have told us about that and we were able to uh, capture some of that footage and then we can work with the people involved sharing some of our materials so that it helps yep. inform their studies. Um, and that yeah. was the first time that had been filmed? I th- yeah, that's, that's yeah. The, I th- first in terms of film. And also while we were at Monterey, we filmed the mother, sea otter, uh, hiding mm. her baby up under the jetty. And again, that's something that hadn't been seen before, but it's because we're there every day looking and watching one particular animal. We mm-hmm. Perhaps you notice things in, that other people haven't yeah. had enough time because they're looking at multiple yeah. animals to do. So um, we rely on scientists and hopefully we're able to give something back to them as well. And, and actually, it's really rewarding, isn't it? Because, yeah, um, you know, the scientific community give us so many of our new stories to be able to pay back yeah. and, and um, you know, share some of the data uh, and things. It's, it's really good. And, yeah, it, it makes the whole, the whole job more satisfying, really, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, um, well, the, Mon- the Monterey one was one of my favorites. Um, I think uh, uh, I, f- I lost track of how often I heard uh, President Obama say something like never before seen on camera or, <laughs> you know, a newly discovered species or, or whatever. But I mean, in that, that particular example you mentioned about the otter, and I think even in that episode, did you, I mean, how do you get some of those camera shots? Because it was almost like you had a camera on the <laughs> on the otter it seemed like and then certainly <laughs> underwater there's it seemed like maybe one of the i i know scientists put cameras on 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 uh, uh subjects i guess if you one way of putting it and so you seem like you're uh some incredible footage let's put it that way we do in fact have cameras ca- cam cameras on the whales uh in the yeah. in the middle of the feeding event and that was because of the scientists we work with they have permits to put those cameras on there right. Right. And so we were able to share the, the footage, which gives an incredible perspective. To actually be inside a uh, feeding frenzy on the back of a whale is, mm. I mean, yeah. as, as filming goes, that one that one's incredibly special. Um, they, they, they use suction cups, don't they, yeah. to stick onto the skin. So it's, um, mm. you know, just sticks on. And then after a time, uh, the seawater gets in and releases the camera. So it's totally non-invasive. And just floats um, to the top and pick it up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's a really lovely way of observing things. Uh, with the otters, you know, we we have to operate under all the permits and restrictions right, because right. Um, otters can be easily disturbed in the busy yeah. California coastline. Uh, but we staked out under the jetty with with um, mm. remote cameras, and I think you get a sense of the otter sort of swimming directly underneath one of the cameras. Yeah. Um, so you know, you use different technologies um, uh, through the series to to help you film whatever it is you need to film. And some of the technology is quite new. Um, mm. So we're, we're filming um, in colour at night time in Africa, mm. where the rhinos are having their yeah, water hole. Um, you, you can see better down the camera than you can do with your eyes, your own vision under the starlight. Mm. So it's it's actually, it's weird, because when you're looking down the camera, you can see what's going on and you feel safe. But when you're not looking down the camera, you feel <laughs> it can feel quite vulnerable. Mm. Especially I think uh, past. <laughs> no, I think uh, that that I forgot that waterhole scene is incredible, actually. Um, and uh, and what what we're able to you you're able to bring to uh, to our eyes. I mean, how do you? Uh, um, is is there a bit of an arms race when it comes to nature? To these these blockbuster nature docs. It seems like uh, how do you improve on the past one? How do you make it more high definition? How do you well, capture that? I mean, or is that? Or is it just because you're just responding to the technology and it's allowing you to do more things that you could could do 20, 30, 40 years ago? There's no doubt with every increase or advancement in technology, it allows you to film things in new ways. Yeah. Um, but really, um, it's to me, it's about storytelling. Yeah, and, that's good to say. And yeah. it's about finding new stories. And so, uh, and that's actually about scientific advancement. 
Mm. So as long as there are amazing biologists out, out in the field studying yeah. these creatures and discovering more about them, then we will have new stories to tell. And I think what audiences really love is novelty and surprise in the stories we give. And, and that's why Nature Docs, you can always tune into the next one because a good Nature Doc will tell you stuff you haven't seen before, yeah. show you stuff you haven't seen before. Mm. And then at the same time, that waterhole one is also one of, another one of these, well, Maybe it's too early to say success story, but you've another example of where um, black rhinos were essentially almost extinct, right? Now we're at least there's a a, a decent size herd in in Savo, and and there's a, you, many of these stories throughout the throughout the the doc series. Well, I, I, like I said earlier, you know, nature exists where we let it, yeah. and it thrives under our protection and wise management. But it's very easy for those things to to go wrong. So we have to be active and engaged and give our support now more than ever. And I, I'd never be complacent about it because overall we are in the middle of a you know a, a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis. So that's an extinction crisis. Mm. Um, you know, and and of course, there's escalating pollution everywhere. So there's there are massive, massive global challenges. That, it, uh, it's a mini bounce back though, because there were originally six thousand of those rhino in that right, area. Right. Now they they are come back from the brink of extinction to just over a hundred. Yeah. But it's you know it's scale, and also um, as with the monarch butterflies we feature in Monterey. Oh you know, they are right on the edge. And it's only if we protect these places that we are going to keep these animals. And not just these animals, everything that within that ecosystem affects everything else. And that's that's the balance that is, is just so delicate. And hopefully in the, in the parks where we tell a story of a, one film, one park, it gives you a bit more depth to understand the way in which these things interact and how mm. important that, that interaction is. Yeah, that was a actually it was a bit bittersweet that whole monarch butterfly thing because I had grow, I remember growing up as a kid in the states you just that was you know any nature magazine you got was all you know you always had a story it seemed like every year on the monarch butterflies and this massive well, I hadn't realized they had been affected so much and that's mm -hmm. just in the last 30, 40 years you know so uh, but I guess um, you know in terms of um, you know, we've, you've got this campaign that's going with it. And as you said, it's both on the individual level and uh, um, government level. I think you've, I think you've already alluded to this or not or more so even stated it, but what is it when it's all said and done, what, what's the, what's the main lesson you want viewers to take away from, from this series? Um, hopefully to see the, to, uh, to understand the importance of wilderness everywhere. And it's not just the big iconic national parks, it's all wilderness. And it's mm. even the corner of your backyard or, mm. or the, um, the flowers on your window box that, were, you know, that, you, that you put out for the, for the honeybees. You know, it's any bit of wilderness we can have is valuable and will help keep our planet healthy. Mm. And, and it's, it's, it's vitally important that we have that active, strong supportive relationship with with wild places and not all human ideas are bad parks were a human idea we did that and yes. so we, we can be a force for good as yes. much as a force for bad so it's a choice okay and uh what's next for the two of you what what projects do you have? We're just concentrating on getting this out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, was this mostly done over the pandemic it was it must that must have been a quite a challenge it was an incredible challenge. I think we'd we'd filmed a few, maybe five or six sequences um, when when COVID hit, and we had mm. we were filming in five countries at that point when when the the pandemic lockdown first came to the UK, and it was incredibly complex. But we were, in a way we were quite fortunate because one of the things we really wanted to do was work with teams in country, so mm. we have a lot of local people um, working as part of the team. Some of them are even the assistant producer, permanently based in the countries such as uh, Rene in Chile or Chilean assistant producer. And so when we weren't able to get back, they carried on filming and uh, we came up with some, uh, we were using tech to be able to talk to them and look at the rushes, mm -hmm. but we were also doing things uh, like in Gununglusa National Park, you see the Titan Arum, that huge plant. So, it's, so it has a balloon the size of a basketball hoop. You Amazing. see that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we built, uh, the team built a papier-mâché version of it. We shot around it 
we edited it, put it together and sent it out to the team on location saying, this is how we'd like to capture it. This is what we're thinking. So we were able to communicate um, thanks to the internet and technology in a way that was that you couldn't have even imagined would have been possible even two or three years ago. Um, but yeah, so having local people also gives you that perspective of mm. parks that you wouldn't get if you just flew in, filmed and left. You know, they're, yeah. they're very personal yeah. portraits, um, both from the local teams and from the president's involvement as well. Mm. And I guess that's a that's a that's an important point. I mean, what do you as a, as filmmakers do you see burgeoning uh, film industries in some of these areas that are you well, know, yeah. yeah, you certainly see a development of of um, local talent, and that's great on many levels. You know, it's um, it's good for for sort of the representation of um, the local voice and the authenticity of that. Yeah. It's also it's also really good from um, an air miles point of view, yeah. isn't it? If we right. yeah. have more cruising countries, so I think I, hopefully it's um, it's sort of it's set in our minds and across the industry that that we can do this more and um, and work with crews more remotely, and and that's yeah that can only be good. Well. Um, I would have to agree based on what I've seen in, in the five episodes. It's a, uh, it's stunning. It's beautiful. It's uh well, well told loves love, uh, lots of great stories and uh, definitely a well, well worth a watch. And um, you know, as we definitely have to uh, tackle this uh, as I used to tell, as my tell my teenagers, I, I said, you guys are going to save the, save the world. And then I've realized we don't, we can't even wait that long, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, we need to act now. So uh, I do appreciate, uh, thank you so much for bringing this film uh, out and uh, for your time today. It's been, it's been great having you on. And I just want to thank again, f- acclaimed filmmakers, James Honeyborn and Sophie Todd, our great national parks released on April 13th on Netflix. I'd like to give a shout out to Sam and Joe Graves at Intersound Audio in Eskrick, England in deepest, darkest Yorkshire. A big thanks to Nevin Apanovich, podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show. And finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas. You can reach out to us on YouTube, social media, or directly by going to our website, www.factualamerica.com and clicking on the Get in Touch link. And as always, please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.